This is House Planning Help, episode 240. Hi there, I'm Ben Adam Smith, and this is the podcast for you if you're interested in self build because I'm exploring what houses we should be building in the 21st century and trying to break down the major roadblocks that may get in our way. And today it's an episode on starting. How do you start? If you go all the way back to the beginning of the journey, how do you start? It's difficult doing a podcast like this where we're 240 episodes in and you take for granted what you've already learned. So I've been having a little think if I was right back at the beginning and perhaps I didn't know what I do now, how would I advise that you set off on your journey? First, though, I want to talk about the Garden Fund. Now, you're going to hear a little bit about this in the coming year if you're sticking with me on the podcast, because there will come a point in your project when you run out of money. Hopefully it will be a very small amount of money and you're not halfway through the build or anything and you've run out of money and that would be a lot more serious. However, we're in our house now. We've got a little bit of landscaping, but there are lots more projects that we would like to do in the garden. So I'm opening up the garden fund and banging the drum because we've got to make some cash this year so that we can push that forwards. And amongst the gardening fund, obviously, what we do at Regen Media, we make videos or perhaps it might be the hub. If you've toyed with the idea of getting involved, please do it. We're just going to try various different ways. We'll have more workshops this year as well. But the garden fund, I'll let you know how that's going and whether I'm making any serious progress and trying to bump up the bank balance to then go and spend it all again. That, that's the downside, isn't it? <laughs> you, you make it, you spend it. So garden fund day one, you'll be hearing lots more on this. Let's get to today's podcast. And it was interesting because I was wondering about whether I should do a podcast on starting the self-build journey for a second time. So let's say I go out today and say, I want to build another house that I'm going to live in. What would I need to do? And in some respects, I feel as if there's not anything that's that confusing anymore compared to when I was going through it the first time and you're trying to piece everything together and understand how things work. So clearly that is a good thing. It means going through one build, you are going to learn a lot. What I don't know is if I then decided just to get back to normality and forget about all this building houses, whether I would then forget all that information. That's why we're keen to probe all these people as they're finishing up their builds to get their best information to pass on to you. So putting myself back in that mindset, I think I started very much on the research side of things, the soft way to begin, which there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm going to put right at the beginning of my how to start planning a self-build, the fact that you need to have a look at your finances. Oh, boring. Who wants to do that? Look at their finances. This is important because without doing the proper work, I'm not talking about just, oh, well, let's just do on the back of a fag packet. This is how much I have to spend. I mean, really look at it seriously. Consider your assets maybe you're not as willing to dispose of your assets as you would like to think that you are. It's the same with the house that you live in. Are you prepared to sell up, move into rented accommodation, know that you'll be outlaying money right, left and centre? It becomes slightly riskier. And that those are the assets that we're talking about. Your income, it's maybe not necessarily guaranteed as well. So you've got to factor all these things in. And then when it gets serious, the borrowing. Not just what do I think I will be able to borrow, how much can you borrow? Because if you've got this number that is set in stone, it's going to really help you guide where your project is going. And some of the things that I discovered on my own journey is, yes, I could stretch to more. And I don't know how you stop yourself from doing that. Um, maybe you've just got to be the, the sort of character. And it's difficult when it's something that you want so much. But I think without this groundwork, you are really not set in reality. There's nothing wrong with doing the fun stuff. And we're going to come to that in a minute. But I also think I would be starting the land search. And that's not to say that I would rush out and buy a piece of land. I just think that this is such an important part of the process that you need to get underway with it because it will no doubt take time. Maybe something lands on your lap and 
It's very easy. You might have that plot already within the confines of your existing property if you're lucky or perhaps a relative has passed away and you can use their site or whatever it might be. For most people, though, I think you're going out on that hunt for the ideal place to build your house. And of course, there is no ideal place. So you've got to start thinking about all the practical stuff of, well, really, how much do I need? And I see this in the hub as well as people go through the process that it's a little bit flexible, isn't it? Because as the land comes up, you don't want to turn your back on opportunities, but you've just got to be really careful that you don't go too big. I suppose you could say be too careful about going too small as well, because then you build your fantastic house and realise, actually, this is not what I want. It's, it's hard to get right, isn't it? But I think if you start that land search, one of the good things that's going to happen is you're going to connect into what you can really get for your money. Because you may be living in cloud cuckoo land thinking, well, I can get all these things that I want, which I think is probably very rare. You're never going to get everything you want. At least if you started that search, you realise all the time it's going to take up as well. And it'd be really good if you could narrow down where it is that you would like to build, at least initially, just so that you're not searching everywhere. I suppose there is the flip side. Maybe you are someone who is prepared to up sticks, move about, go where the land is a lot cheaper. You've still obviously got to be careful about all the various things that we talk about, making sure that when you do find the land, you appraise it properly. But I think what I'm saying at this early stage is to just ground yourself in reality. Alongside this, yes, the learning. And as I mentioned, it's difficult to know what that learning has done to you because you just absorb it, don't you? So I would never rush into anything. And I think it was probably a really, really good thing that I went through four years of actually not being able to do very much before it all started moving. And then it actually happened very quickly, more or less a two year period, one of designing, the other of building. So when I say background learning, what does that actually consist of? I'm going to break it down into books, I think is the first thing. Mark Brinkley, we've had him on the podcast a couple of times before. It's going to take you a while to read the House Builders Bible. It's also a good reference document to come back to. And I've had a look at some of the other books that you can get. And there's actually not a massive amount out there. If you have read something good, this would be excellent to contribute in the, the show notes. Because I know of a few a lot of them are quite out of date. And that's why I take my hat off to Mr. Brinkley every couple of years, revising that book. And that is what has made it so good that the detail in there is of the time. And that's perhaps where the next bit, your self-build magazines come into their own as well, because the information they publish each month it's bang up to date with what's going on, what's relevant now. And I imagine, I think I noticed this, that when you're subscribed to these magazines, it's almost a cycle. You feel like you're, a, you know, the new, new, new stuff, new stuff, new stuff. OK, a little bit of new stuff. little, uh, And then before a few years are out, actually, you feel I've read this. I know what they're saying here. It's because it's a process and you get to understand or as much as you can before you've been through it yourself, that process. So the magazines are good. Home building and renovating. Build it. Self-build and design. Grand Designs have their own magazine as well. There are others. Those, I would say, are the main ones. With those as well come the shows. They're well worth going along to. In fact, I've actually wondered, I know I don't need to now, but just going back and sitting in one of the seminar rooms and absorbing the information as, you know, how are they teaching that? What are the important things to understand? What did I miss on my journey? So they're very good. The one thing I will say is they're tiring. Don't take a, the whole family, either go on your own or go with your husband or wife, because uh, that is the best way. Just relax into it. Don't overdo it. And that's where seminars can be good, too, because you need to enjoy this part of the process. So feel like it is an investment that is worth making. I don't know. You could have this like I did at number one. I'm just saying that I think the finance, the worst thing you could possibly do is have all these fantastic dreams and then realise you're never going to build the house, even on the cheapest bit of land possible. Hopefully that's not the case. That's why I put finance at number one. So you've got the industry events. Let's not forget the National Self-Build and Renovation Centre. Very good. They host 
big events. They've got three shows throughout the year. They've also got some of the seminars that we talked about, workshops. I've been involved in a couple of those too. Very good. And I must at this point mention The Hub because that's the whole purpose of what we're doing at The Hub. We're trying to make it more enjoyable to go through the process. So we are constantly working on our in-depth video case studies to try and cover complete builds, all with different variables so that it will help you on your journey. And we've got courses, again, constantly adding, uh, maybe even taking stuff out. One of the new things that we've introduced this year is office hours. And we're going to be every Monday, I'm going to be available on a call. In fact, I had my first session of that this Monday and had a 45 minute chat with Beth about her project. And that was great to see. She came armed with all these questions and I threw as much back as I possibly could. So getting really proactive there. But the office hours is a regular thing on a Monday that we're introducing in the hub where you can turn up armed with questions. And we don't record that. We record our conference calls, which are more learning opportunities, but that you can incorporate anything you want to know about your project as we have guest experts on. So there's another way, background learning, and it just doesn't stop. I'm still learning now. I'm, this is one of the interesting things about the new year, thinking, what else do I want to know? There's so much out there, but if I were starting a project again, would it be disgraceful just to get on and go for it? Or should I really be going through that research all over again? Hmm, that's something that's, that occupies my mind every so often. Another thing that we must add into background learning that I think, I wonder whether this was a different point altogether. It's about visiting as many finished homes as possible. Chatting to the self-builders, also use their connections. If they're open days, sometimes the architect turns up or the builder, find out what they've been like and try to go to things that you wouldn't necessarily want to do yourself because it will broaden your thinking. So don't, if you want to build very traditional, go to all traditional homes. I would encourage you at this stage, you're just learning, go to some contemporary houses, see what they're, what they're like, what they feel like and I thoroughly enjoy that even now, just seeing how different people approach their projects, different pieces of land, different constraints. It's always fascinating to me. So we're going to put that under learning. I think that that's as much as I've got under this section. There are obviously many ways to learn. I suppose we could say podcast, couldn't we? But what you are doing is you are investing in probably the biggest ticket item of your life. So it'd be really foolish to... Go and buy that piece of land. I know I've given you that as a, a thing that you should be doing on day one is going and starting the land search, but I'm not expecting you to buy it. I'm just, just grounding you in reality. Put the brief together is another one that maybe it can't be set in stone at this stage, and it probably will develop for some time. Once you're under construction, you don't really want to be changing things, but to just start putting in things that you know already. What are the accommodation requirements? What is the style of the project? How much space do you need? You know, you can revisit that. That's definitely a good tip of as you encounter rooms that you feel are rooms that would be good in your next house, measure them up. Make sure you've got an idea of how big that space is because you're not an architect. You're not going to be uh, tuned in to exactly the same as what they're thinking. So come with your own ideas. Use the property that you're in at the moment and observe how your family use that property. Where are you spending your time? Is it all in the kitchen or is it, in fact, all in front of the TV or... Are you moving around? You know, I was very keen when I built this house that we wouldn't have a dining room or rooms that just I know would not get used. So it made perfect sense. And the passive house side of things helped too, because when you're cooking in the same place as your living space and your dining room, and yes, you make a smell, it's really comforting to know, oh my goodness, I've upset K, but I know that the ventilation is just, it's chugging away. And the odours, they don't stick around. They will go eventually. So that's a nice thing too. But all of these sorts of things about how you would like to live in the house, jot that down. Look at the house where you currently are. Also, those things that drive you crazy. 
how could you change that next time round? Don't be too prescriptive, but we will add all of those elements to the brief. Something else we should talk about is also how are you going to make this happen? What is the build route that you're going to choose? And for that, again, it's getting realistic with your circumstances because you can save money by doing things yourself, but you've got to know yourself, haven't you, that you can really do this. You've got to know that you've got time. Is your time being best spent on site where you might have to have a lot of patience because you're learning new things or actually are you better off earning the money and getting someone else to do it? So there are various options that you can explore. Perhaps like me, you might end up going down the main contractor route. We had a full package from our architecture firm. And that was really because we could afford it. We wanted a good experience and we wanted some involvement. It's not completely hands off. I guess you could do that. You could do a project manager, hire the project manager to be the one point of contact, do everything. I'm not sure I'd be too happy going down that route or how many people do that. Something that I tend to see a bit more often is when maybe parts of the build are broken down. So a company might deliver the frame and then it'll all be airtight and all the rest of it. Perhaps they'll do the foundations too. And then it's onto the fit out team. And perhaps you might manage those bits in between. There are various ways of doing it. Which are the right ways for you? And I do think it comes back on these leaning on your own skills. You've got to know yourself. Are you a project manager at work? Is that a skill that actually is going to save you a lot of money? Are you someone who's very practical? You're always building things. Maybe it makes sense, but it's that time equation, isn't it? You're going to have to put in more time. Obviously, if you get it right, there's more saving. Where things go wrong, it's got to be that situation where they've underestimated what is actually involved. You know, I'm under no illusions that let's say I did a second self and I thought, oh, this first one's been brilliant. I can now build a house myself. It would be a disaster. It really would. So I would never put that on myself. If anything, I would just go the next step, perhaps maybe do project managing between various different elements of a build. So you've got that to think about. Very important thing. All these things overlap a little bit. And I do think at some point, it's quite difficult to know what the timeline for all, all this is, the right people. You've got to start putting the team together. And that's definitely not a day one thing, but having a few ideas will really help. And particularly if you feel it's a good fit, if things have just worked out naturally, maybe it's the right area as well. They work there. You've been to a, a few sites that someone has put together. So, that's something that I think we're going to finish on for today. Hopefully that's been useful if you're just starting out on your project. I wanted to do this because I don't think we've ever done a podcast on how you might start on your journey. These are just ideas I've put together, as I often say when I do one of these sorts of podcasts, that this is just my experience. We encourage criticism in the show notes, constructive criticism, I should say of what else we should be thinking about, but certainly money, also that research period, ah, not jump in. I still like that piece of advice that I was given, even if I didn't quite execute on it properly about do the planning up front. It may take two or three years, but hopefully by then you'll have the land and you can execute within a year. That still makes sense or something along those lines. Don't jump in, get going, and then it takes five years on site and costs you three times as much. That's exactly what you don't want to happen. We'll continue the conversation in the show notes or on social media, whichever is your preference. Houseplanninghelp.com forward slash 240 is the number for this episode. A couple of things to finish up on today. Firstly, I am going to read you some iTunes reviews. We haven't done this for a while, so let's do it today. P. Forrester writes, Ben has done a great job of shining a light on self-build particularly and the construction industry generally. House planning help is accessible to people without a background in construction, while also being a source of inspiration and information for anyone who works in the industry. An excellent podcast that is the embodiment of realising you can never know everything, and there are always new things to learn. Heartily recommended to anybody with an interest in building design and construction, grand designs and sustainability. 
Thank you, P. Forrester. Nice one. Also, Rocksmith2000 says, glad I found this podcast. Slightly shorter, this one. House Planning How is without doubt one of the best podcasts out there for anyone interested in new builds or eco housing in general. Can't recommend it enough. If you could leave us an iTunes review, it would really help just flag up. Hey, look, here's a podcast that might be interesting. Try to explain to others what it is you get out of it and the format just so they understand. That would be great. Doesn't have to be long. Make an honest review. We'd absolutely love that. iTunes is still the biggest directory. So if you can do it in there and you listen from there, obviously, if you listen on some other app, don't worry about doing it in there. Maybe your app has some way of recommending podcasts. We'd like a review on that. But iTunes still the way most people go. Also, if you are one of our friends in the construction industry, can I help you out? That's what I'm asking now because... <laughs> garden fund. I'm trying to raise up some money to have some nice pretty things in my garden. And you know what? That costs quite a bit of cash. So we need to get making more videos at Regen Media and we love it if we can stay in construction. I don't really want to be going outside that. I'd love it to be ecological builds if we're totally honest. But if you're trying to maybe get more visitors to your website. You need some creative marketing. Video can be very good at this. Maybe we can help you out at Regen Media. So that's my second thing. <coughs> Garden fund. I need to get some more projects on the plate, get our crews out filming. Perhaps we can help you. We'll put a link in the show notes and you can find out more. And finally, The Hub. If you haven't signed up to The Hub, well, actually email me right now. Why have you not signed up to The Hub? We're trying to help you. We're throwing ourselves at you. All sorts of resources in there. I mentioned how we've introduced a new feature called Office Hours, trying to give you more access and more opportunity just to get your project moving more quickly, ironing out some of the difficulties, making sure you don't fall for the common pitfalls. So I will try to help you as much as I can. We're building up our digital resources, the archive that we've got there. I've mentioned about my own in-depth video case study. Yes, we're not gonna make any more podcasts on my house build. Unfortunately, you're gonna hear all about the case study. So that is gradually being released each month, uh, another episode. So the first one of the year was on how the design developed, all of the tricky parts from going from just pencil sketch, then introducing materials, then thinking about planning, then struggling with that. And we were very close to neighboring buildings. So how do we prevent overshadowing? Chris Parsons from Parsons and Whitley, the boss leads us through what happened there. I think there's a section on PHPP as well and how the overheating risk, this is great. I'm so pleased they did this, is down to zero. So it should not go over 25 degrees. I've got all my little thermometers around here checking it. We've been nowhere near 25 yet, but then it is winter. It's amazing how the temperature can get up if you get really, really sunny days, then it can go up to 22. Yeah, I know. 22 degrees. That's actually not necessarily all around the house. That's right in our, our main room where I guess we've got a lot of the glazing. What else is in there? We've got our courses where we're underway. I'm hoping to deliver a lot more courses in 2019. We've got the forum where you can interact with other self-builders. Also, we have an opportunity for you to start a progress log. This is something that I did through my entire build just because I thought it was a great outlet. It also allows you to see how much you have achieved. And it is interesting when it gets to the construction phase. Definitely everyone's number of updates takes it. It, it goes quiet, but we totally understand how you're busy and perhaps you're not needing as much input. But if you would like to be a hub member, we would like you in there too. We want to help you. Check it all out, houseplanninghelp.com forward slash join. That's your lot for today. Thank you so much for listening. The House Planning Help podcast is produced by Regen Media, content that matters.